Okay. Folks, I have the pleasure of introducing to you uh, Professor Craig Simons, who uh, recently retired from the Naval War College, and he is the chairman emeritus, or the uh, a professor emeritus from the United States Naval Academy, where he taught for many years. As a brief uh, description of his background, he is a distinguished historian of the American Civil War and maritime history. And he got his PhD from the University of Florida, his master's degree from Florida as well. And he has been in the field of naval history and the US Civil War uh, since about 1976. He is also a former naval officer, served 71 to 73. And I have the great pleasure of stating that when I taught at the Naval Academy between 1989 and 1991, he was my department chair. And he very graciously allowed me, despite my military naval uh, lieutenant rank, to teach the Civil War course to the midshipmen for that period of time, for which I have never been more grateful for having been able to allow to do that. And as a note on that, the instructor, the professor who normally taught that course, is our next presenter, Mary DeCredico. And Professor Simons uh, also allowed me to be on a search committee which brought in Professor Tucker, who is still at the Naval Academy to this day, as I recall. Professor Simons is a very distinguished author. His book on uh, General Joe Johnston, <clears throat> for those of you who think all he did was retreat, you should read Professor Simons' book for an update as to what uh, Joe Johnston was really all about. <clears throat> He's also well known for the book uh, Lincoln and His Admirals, and because people don't pay much attention to the Navy during the Civil War, I give you Professor Simons, who will correct all of your misconceptions about how the Navy saved the Army at the peninsula. And today is the Navy's birthday, October 13th. So without further ado, Professor Simons. What a great introduction. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. I appreciate the patience and the commitment of all of those in this particular roundtable in tolerating our the necessity of our having a virtual meeting here. Uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime in the future when we can all be in the same room. Now, I know this is a Civil War group, and I did spend four decades researching and writing about Civil War topics, as Mark mentioned, including Civil War naval topics, but lately I have been focused on World War II. So what I thought I would try to do tonight is to address both the Civil War and the Second World War by examining the leadership challenges that were faced by two men, each of them prominent in one of those two wars. Now in my classes at the Naval Academy, I often told my students that studying leaders of the past would make them better leaders. I hope that's true. Uh, I'm not really sure that leadership is something that can be taught, but if it can, surely history studied in depth and over a lifetime is the best laboratory for that. Now, I, I doubt that any of my students, when they confronted a situation in, say, Afghanistan, said to themselves, ah, aha, I know what to do here because of what Grant did in the wilderness or because of what Spruance did at Midway. That's not how it works. The ancient historian Heraclitus once wrote that you never step in the same stream twice because by the time you step in at the second time, the water is different, the pebbles in the stream bed have shifted, the branches flowing past are different. If it's winter, the stream may be frozen. So there are no perfect analogies in history. And yet, having crossed that stream once, even vicariously, can prepare you for the kinds of problems, some of them familiar, some entirely new, that could confront you again when trying to cross it a second time. That, I think, is what Mark Twain meant when he said history doesn't repeat itself, but it often does rhyme. That line's being used a lot more these days in either hope or fear. So let's take a look at these two individuals and see if we can discern some commonalities or perhaps differences and come up with some conclusions about why they were successful leaders. 
Now I'm going to try to share my screen here. All right, good. Well, I will continue then. Here we are. Here they are. That's uh, Farragut on the left and uh, Nimitz on the right. I love these two photos. One of the reasons I really wanted to show this is because look at those expressions. Grim, steely-eyed. Already there's one commonality. And note the similarity in body language. Did you notice that Farragut has his right arm over his left while Nimitz has his left arm over his right? Did you notice that? You know why? No, Nimitz was not left-handed. That's a good guess. I suspect the reason is that Nimitz was missing the ring finger from his left hand, the result of an encounter with the reduction gear some years before. And so he's hiding that in his right elbow. More about Nimitz later, but let me talk first about Farragut. In many ways, Farragut was a personification of 19th century America. It's easy to check off the characteristics that support that claim. First, he's the son of an immigrant, a first generation American. He was a Western pioneer, born in 1801 in Tennessee only five years after Tennessee became a state, when it was still very much part of the frontier. He was essentially a self-made man, inheriting nothing from his parents or grandparents. He was a dedicated champion of the National Union. And given that, he was pretty close to being almost an archetype of a mid 19th century American. His father, Jorge Farragut, immigrated to America from Minorca, island in the Western Mediterranean, when it was still part of Spain. The British would later seize it in 1798, but it was Spanish when Jorge came to the United States. And after arriving there, he subsequently married another immigrant, a woman from Scotland, which is where Farragut's middle name, Glasgow, comes from. Now, one particularly arresting thing about their son is that he started his naval career very young. Mark will tell you that students at the Naval Academy are generally 18, sometimes 19 years old when they come to Annapolis, though I had a few that were 17, and a few who come to Annapolis in their early 20s. Now, according to statute, you can't be older than 23 when you start. And those who were 22 or 23 years old, usually it was because they had spent several years in the enlisted ranks. I've got a great story about that if you want to ask me about it during Q&A. But others come to Annapolis after already completing several years of college. They would apply to the academy, not quite make it, go to, let's say, Ohio State, spend two years there, keep on applying and finally make it after two years at Ohio State, but there are no transfer students at the academy. Everyone, regardless of the number of academic credits earned elsewhere, everyone starts over as a plebe and spends four years by the Severn. I once taught history to a plebe who already had a bachelor's degree from Yale in history. She got a B. Most midshipmen arrive at the academy between 18 and 22. So how old was Farragut when he became a midshipman? Anybody want to guess? I can't see you, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, Bill Vaudry is holding up two fingers. I hope that doesn't mean two. I think that means, ah, 12. He was nine, Bill, nine. In the first half of the 19th century, there was no Naval Academy. West Point had been founded in 1802, but Annapolis was not established until 1845. In part then, because the complexities of steam engineering by then mandated that officer candidates had to know a little bit more than just leadership before they went to sea. But prior to that, prior to 1845, prospective naval officers got their training the old fashioned way, on the job. They would rely primarily on influence or family connections, uh, apply to their senators or their congressmen for a midshipman's appointment, and they would go aboard a US Navy warship without any preliminary training at all. 
Most did not know port from starboard, bow from stern. Captains took them on as protégés, and for several years, these young gentlemen, as they were called, learned the ropes, literally, until they were ready to take a test, written and oral. If they passed, they became what was called, what else, a past midshipman. A past midshipman was eligible for a lieutenant's commission when an opening occurred. Now, the average age at which young men, boys really, embarked on this journey as a midshipman was about 16, some 15. So how did Farragut become a midshipman at nine? Well, the story starts, ironically enough, in New Orleans, where 50 years later, Captain Farragut would win his first great naval victory. Here's the story. Jorge Farragut, by then a widower, was a civilian employee in the Navy Yard at New Orleans. And one day when he was fishing on the Mississippi, a canoe came drifting past him, apparently with nobody in it. On investigation, he found an elderly man lying unconscious in the bottom of the boat. He had no identification, couldn't speak. So Farragut brought him home, nursed him for weeks until he finally expired. Eventually, he learned that the man was the 84-year-old father of Navy Captain David Porter, who commanded the American gunboat squadron at New Orleans. When Porter learned about it, he was grateful for Farragut's kindness and offered to help out the widowed Farragut by taking one of his two sons as a midshipman. Now, that's actually a pretty generous offer because appointments as midshipmen, then as now, were rare and valued. So Jorge gratefully accepted and sent off his nine-year-old son, James. Wait a minute. James? I thought his name was David Farragut. Well, there's a story here, too. As young Farragut grew to manhood, he decided to honor his benefactor by changing his first name from James to David. Now, that got a little complicated two years later in 1813 when Captain Porter's wife gave birth to a son who was christened David. So now there are two David in the family. This, of course, was David Dixon Porter, usually referred to as Farragut's foster brother, who also became an admiral during the Civil War. For the next 40 years, David Farragut, as he was now known, was promoted along with his peers, indeed promoted ahead of most of them, eventually reaching the rank of captain, which was the highest rank then available in the United States Navy in the 1850s. In 1860, as we know, Lincoln was elected president, and the protests about that led to the secession crisis. At that time, Captain Farragut was living in Norfolk, Virginia, partly because then, as now, Norfolk was a good Navy town, but also because he had married a Norfolk woman. His first wife, Susan, died 20 years before in 1840, and his second wife, was not only a Virginian by birth and by residence, she was named Virginia. So here's a man born in Tennessee, raised in Louisiana, living in Virginia, married to a Southern woman whose family owned slaves. Here was the moment that reveals who Farragut was, because when he learned in April 1861 that the state of Virginia had voted to secede from the Union after the clash at Fort Sumter and Lincoln's call for volunteers, Farragut announced that he would not stay in that state another minute. This act of mine, he told his wife, may cause years of separation from your family, so you need to decide quickly whether you will go north with me or remain here. He packed up what he could carry in a valise and left Norfolk for New York City that same day. His wife went with him. 
you might want to compare this episode with Robert E. Lee's action when he heard about Virginia's secession. In one of the more poignant passages in Douglas Southall Freeman's biography of Lee, Freeman describes how Lee underwent an agonizing trial when he had to choose between his state and his country. According to Freeman, he stayed up all night, pacing back and forth in his study, racked by doubt, unable to decide where his duty lay. Supposedly, again, according to Freeman, his wife downstairs could hear the sound of his boots on the floorboards as he paced back and forth through most of the night. And in the morning, he came downstairs to tell her he had decided to resign his commission and seek service with Virginia. Freeman's chapter on this episode is entitled, The Decision He Was Born to Make. Well, Farragut's decision was the one he was born to make. But for him, there was no agonizing, no midnight pacing back and forth, no uncertainty. From the moment he learned of Virginia's secession, this son of immigrants knew that he was an American first. The moment the state of Virginia abandoned the Union, Farragut abandoned the state. Curiously, despite that, there was some uncertainty in Washington about his loyalty and frankly about his age too. He was 60 years old at the time. Now, we all know that's a spring chicken these days, but it was considered pretty long in the tooth in 1861. The Union was planning an assault on New Orleans in the spring and both Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells and the Assistant Secretary Gustavus Fox wondered if Farragut was up to it. So they asked his younger foster brother, David Dixon Porter. Porter's reply is interesting. Started out well enough. He wrote, I see no reason why he should not be competent to do all that is expected of him. Okay, so far so good. Then he added that while his foster brother was likable, and personally brave, he, quote, has no administrative qualities, wants stability, and loses too much time in talking. Well, at least he didn't say he drooled at the mouth. It's very likely that Porter made his comments because he was angling for that command himself. He didn't get it slow as the mail is today, it was even slower then. And by the time Porter's letter reached Washington, Farragut had already captured New Orleans. A century later, the historian Charles Dufour would publish a book about the New Orleans campaign with the title, The Night the War Was Lost. If that's a slight exaggeration, it nevertheless acknowledges the strategic impact of Farragut's achievement. Now, another characteristic of Farragut's character, besides his boldness of action, was that he was politically savvy. Two years later, during Lincoln's second presidential campaign in 1864, Farragut was in New York, where his flagship, the Hartford, was undergoing a refit. And while he was there, he attended a union rally outside the Cooper Union. And according to the New York Herald, when he was pointed out in the audience, the crowd rose to its feet, broke out in one loud, hearty, prolonged cheer. Resplendent in his Navy uniform, Farragut bowed, smiled, waved. But when the organizers called him up on stage to make a speech, he replied in words that could not have been more welcome to Lincoln if the president had written them himself. I was invited here this evening, not as a politician, but as a naval officer, to see the unanimity and the union feeling which prevails here. But I must leave politics to you, my fellow citizens. I meddle not with politics in the way of speeches. I will do my duty on the sea while you do yours here. Given all the troubles that Lincoln had with ambitious cabinet members and political generals like McClellan and others, 
it was no doubt a great relief for him to hear that here was one officer at least who stayed above the fray, untempted by the adulation of the crowd or the fruits of political office. Later that year, of course, Farragut did indeed do his duty upon the sea when he charged into the bay at Mobile, Alabama. Most of you already know the story. The Hartford was halfway through the channel into the bay when there was a muffled thump and the ship immediately to his right, the ironclad Tecumseh, suddenly reared up out of the water, turned over on its side and shot downward like an arrow, taking most of her crew down with her. Sunk by a Confederate mine, or as they were known then, torpedoes. When that happened, the ship directly in front of Farragut, the Brooklyn, stopped. Then it began to back down. That, of course, is when Farragut took matters in hand. In order to avoid having the entire column of ships collide into one another like a collapsing accordion, he ordered the Hartford to veer out of line and steam past the Brooklyn directly through the marked minefield. As he passed the Brooklyn, her captain called across to tell him there were torpedoes in the water dead ahead, to which Farragut replied, Oh, come on. There, I, all right, I see some of you, good. Yes, of course, we have to wonder exactly what was the intonation. Was it damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, or damn the torpedoes? Sorry, a little levity. Here's the thing to remember. This was not an act of unthinking bluster, a forlorn charge like the light brigade in the Crimea, or perhaps even picket at Gettysburg. It was a practical response to a swiftly unraveling situation. And it was absolutely the right decision. Any other decision would have led to chaos and disaster. And once through the minefield without casualties, Farragut's squadron easily defeated the smaller rebel fleet and seized command of Mobile Bay. Along with Sherman's capture of Atlanta, Farragut's capture of Mobile Bay helped secure Lincoln's reelection. And that, perhaps more than any other event, was the most strategically decisive event of the war. So it's fairly easy for me to hold up Farragut as a good example of leadership for my midshipman, for his faithfulness to his mentor, for his instinctive and unblinking loyalty to his country, and for his quick thinking in a crisis. So what about Chester Nimitz? Shift your glance. I assume you still have this slide on the screen. You can all see it. Richard Cruz, give me a nod if you, you can. OK, good. All right. On the right there, that's Chester Nimitz. And I think he fits the point I want to make about leadership, but also I wanted to include him, to be honest, because I just finished writing a wartime biography about him, and he is fresh in my mind. It will be out in the spring of next year. You should all be ready to purchase several copies. Now, Chester Nimitz, interestingly enough, was also the son of immigrants, in this case, German immigrants who settled in the hill country of North Texas very near where LBJ grew up. The town where he was born, Fredericksburg, was named for the German Prince Frederick. And it still has a German flavor to it. You can get German food, German beer, on the German restaurants along Main Street. There is, by the way, a wonderful museum there, the National Museum of the Pacific War, which I can highly recommend. Now, people are often perplexed to learn that the National Museum of the Pacific War is in the hill country of Texas. But of course, that's precisely because it is where Chester Nimitz was born. Like Farragut, Nimitz was raised by a surrogate parent, not David Porter, obviously. But Nimitz's father died of a heart attack at the age of 29, four months before Chester was born. So the future admiral was raised by his mother and particularly by his maternal grandfather who taught him 
among many other things, not to obsess about things that were beyond his control. A calm patience was more valuable than panicky activity. Now, Nimitz did not go to sea at nine. By then, the U.S. Naval Academy had come into being, and young boys did not go to sea as midshipmen. They went to school. In fact, Chester Nimitz had no plans to go to sea at all. A turning point in his life occurred when he was watching an artillery demonstration at a county fair that was supervised by a group of recent West Point grads in their smart uniforms. Chester was greatly impressed and asked them about this place called West Point. Whatever they said convinced him that's what he wanted. He approached his congressman to ask about attending West Point and was told that all the appointments that year had been filled. And then the congressman said, what about the Naval Academy? Well, Nimitz had never heard of that, but it sounded okay. And so after passing the admissions test, he went off to Annapolis in 1901 at the age of 17. Nimitz never had to choose between his state and his country as Farragut did. But here's an interesting story about his loyalties that I will share. After he left for Annapolis, his aunts and uncles back in Texas worried that he would come back contaminated by all sorts of Yankee influences. So of course, many of them were horrified when he came back five years later with a young wife in tow, the beautiful 20 year old Catherine Vance Freeman, who was from Brooklyn. During that visit, at least some of Chester's relatives wanted to make sure she knew what was what down here in Texas. So as members of the family sat around over coffee, one of them pointedly asked Chester what he would do if Texas again seceded from the Union. Would he fight for Texas or for that federal government in Washington. Catherine later remembered the woman looking directly at her as she asked this question, as if to say, now you'll see what's what little Yankee girl. Chester smiled graciously and answered quietly, why of course I would fight for the United States against any rebellion. Catherine recalled the woman nearly dropped her teacup. Now, this is not quite the same as deciding to leave home on an hour's notice, and it was hypothetical in any case, but Chester made his loyalty clear. A central aspect of Nimitz's life, and of his command temperament as well, was that calm and deliberate demeanor. He smiled readily, but it was often a tight-lipped smile, the smile you can see here. To some, it implied skepticism or a cautious reserve. It did not. Nimitz kept his mouth tightly shut almost all the time because he had terrible teeth. Growing up in the hill country of Texas, he'd never seen a dentist. And his dental report in 1941 noted that 18 teeth were missing and five more had been replaced by gold. Embarrassed by that, he tended to keep his mouth firmly closed. Like Farragut, Nimitz could make bold decisions. In fact, as bold as Farragut's dash into Mobile Bay. In June of 1942, for example, forewarned of a Japanese approach to Midway, he decided to confront the enemy even though on paper he was badly overmatched. He knew that the strategic mission was to hold on the defensive in the Pacific until after Germany was defeated. He might easily have let the Japanese take the tiny outpost at Midway, and then after they occupied it, he could savage their communications and supply lines. Midway, after all, was more than 3,000 miles from Tokyo, and the Japanese would have a terrible time sustaining themselves. Arguably, that could have been the smart move. Instead, Nimitz decided to send everything he had, all the ships, virtually all the planes, out to meet that threat. 
Like Farragut's decision at Mobile Bay, though, it was not simple audacity. He was not brash. He was not impetuous. He carefully assessed the circumstances, employed what he called calculated risk, and then made his decision. Yes, the Japanese had more carriers, but he had the airstrip on Midway Island. The Japanese had more battleships, but thanks to American code breakers, he knew they were coming. On balance, he believed he could win. And of course he did. Here's another example that's less well known than Midway. A year and a half later in the aftermath of the costly American victory at Tarawa, where a thousand Marines died and 2000 more were wounded in seizing an island less than one square mile in size, there was a lot of worried second guessing about the plan to invade the bigger and stronger island of Kwajalein. All three of Nimitz's subordinate commanders, the fleet commander Ray Spruance, the amphibious commander Richmond Kelly Turner, and the commander of the Marines who would make the assault, Holland M. Smith, all decided that attacking Kwajalein was too ambitious. They insisted it would be to focus on two other smaller islands nearby and attack Kwajalein at some undesignated future date. Nimitz explained his rationale to them. Nimitz never gave orders without giving other people an opportunity to discuss, and he never gave an order without explaining its purpose. Capturing the two outer islands, he said, would not break Japanese power in the Marshalls. Kwajalein would still have to be taken anyway. On the other hand, if Kwajalein fell, those outer islands would lose all their strategic value. Besides, he believed that they had learned important lessons from the bloodbath at Tarawa that could be applied to Kwajalein. His operational commanders were not convinced. Nimitz invited them to state their views. And as he went around the room, every person there proclaimed a preference for an attack on the outer islands. Nimitz waited until everyone had spoken. Then he waited another long pregnant moment before he announced, well, that's fine. We'll hit Kwajalein. Now that should have ended it, but it didn't. Spruance and Turner continued to argue. The volatile Kelly Turner was especially confrontational, telling Nimitz the plan was dangerous and reckless. Finally, Nimitz cut them off. This is it. If you don't want to do it, I can find someone else to do it. Do you want to do it or not? Faced with that ultimatum, they backed down. Now, I will acknowledge that saying that's fine, we'll hit Kwajalein, doesn't quite have the same ring as damn the torpedoes, but it's the same sentiment. And like Farragut's decision at Mobile Bay, it was carefully calculated. Nimitz was convinced the Japanese did not intend to go all in to defend Kwajalein. They would not commit the fleet. And he was equally confident in the adjustments that he had made to the landing protocols from the experience at Tarawa. Still, he risked a great deal. <coughs> By insisting on going ahead against the nearly unanimous opposition of his staff and his own commanders, if the attack had failed, or even if it had succeeded with heavy casualties, his tenure as the Pacific Fleet Commander might have come to an end. <coughs> Excuse me. As at Midway, he carefully considered the risks and ordered the attack. <coughs> it went off like clockwork. The Americans lost just over 300 killed, the Japanese over 8,000. Afterward, the Japanese retreated more than 1,200 miles to the west. It was the beginning of the end for them, and they knew it. Here's another aspect of Nimitz's command temperament I feel compelled to mention, and that is that he had a sense of humor. He didn't really tell jokes, a fellow officer explained. He told stories that had a humorous side. Many of them were shaggy dog stories with a lengthy, even an interminable buildup. It's a characteristic he shared with Abraham Lincoln, 
who, like Nimitz, often used humorous stories to deflect visitors by telling them that whatever circumstance they were complaining about reminded him of a story. One of Nimitz's favorites was about a young doctor who arrived at the home of a nervous father-to-be. Don't worry at all, the doctor told him. Leave it to me, everything will be fine. And the doctor then disappeared into a back room with the expectant mother. After a minute or two, he came out and asked for a butter knife, which the father provided. A few minutes later, he was back to ask for a screwdriver. Then it was a pair of pliers, then a stiff wire with a hook hand. He always paused after each of these to let the tension build. And depending on the audience, this buildup could go on for several minutes. Finally, the prospective father, and by now perhaps his audience as well, could not stand it any longer. Doctor, the expectant father said, is everything all right? Yes, yes, everything's fine, the doctor said. I just can't get my bag open. Well, it's not a knee slapper, I'll confess, but it's the kind of story that he told. Some of them were risque, or at least what was considered risque in the pre-war years. His wife sometimes stopped him when he began one of these in mixed company, but they were a staple of dinner parties at his quarters in Pearl Harbor. If, for example, his guests moved from dinner to the card table, Nimitz might tell the story of the aspiring woman bridge player who was invited to a bridge party at the home of the local champion. Alas, her husband, who was partnered with the hostess, embarrassed everybody, bidding recklessly, forgetting what suit they were in, trumping his partner's ace. When he finally excused himself to make a trip to the bathroom, his humiliated wife apologized for him. The hostess graciously waved off her apology, though she did say that this is actually the first time all evening I've been pretty sure of what he was holding in his hand. Are you get it? You get it? Okay. It might be possible to make a list of the characteristics shared by these two men for a leadership manual. Nimitz's chief of staff, Ray Spruance, essentially did that when he wrote his wife, Margaret, about his boss. Here's what he said. Admiral Nimitz, he wrote, is a marvelous combination of tolerance of the opinions of others, wise judgment after he listened, and determination to carry things through. Tolerance, judgment, determination. Spruance knew what he was talking about, and we can see all three of those characteristics in both of these men. They could and did tolerate the views of others. Indeed, they went out of their way to solicit different ideas, to listen to those ideas carefully and take them seriously. In evaluating those ideas, they calculated all sorts of factors, the plans, of course, and the circumstances, who was involved, the likely outcome, And even if they had to make a quick decision, they did not make rash decisions. Having calculated the odds, they then applied a quiet but firm judgment. Damn the torpedoes. And once the decision was made, they demonstrated a powerful determination to carry it through, not to change course in midstream. Because as we all know, You never really step in the same stream twice. Thanks, I hope you have some great questions. Ah, Bill Vaudry says, Gideon Wells had no patience with, no sympathy for those in the Navy who felt drawn to the South. Yeah, that's true. Buchanan, whose biography I wrote, thought that Maryland was going to secede and resigned. Then found out that, whoops, Maryland did not secede after all and asked to be reinstated. Wells kicked him out. Let's see, uh, who else have we got down here? Thanks for sharing that pageant. Would you agree with Seknav Wells approach? Um, In regards to what in particular, Bill? Professor Well, uh, Bill's writing. Well, William's writing. We have yeah, a go ahead. We have a question from the audience, Dan. So you had mentioned 
that the Hartford was being refit. Uh, and so the refit process back then compared to now, much simpler, much quicker. What did it involve? Did you hear the question, yeah, well, Professor? Yeah, I did. Actually, that's a great question because a lot of the time the ships that were on the blockade duty, and this is the West Blockading Squadron part in the Gulf Blockading Squadron. And what they would do generally is for a short refit to replenish what we would call a, a replenishment. They would go to a local base. Ship Island off the coast of, of uh, Louisiana was one. Key West was one for the East Gulf Blockading Squadron. Uh, the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron used uh, Port Royal, South Carolina, and of course the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron used Norfolk. So they would go to those places, oh, once a month or so. And the turnaround would be probably no more than three, four, five days at the most. The crew would go ashore, run around a little bit, get them back on board and back to the blockading station. But once a year, once a year, every year and a half, they had to go in for a major refit, clean the boilers and all that kind of stuff. And that's when they would go back to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is where the Hartford was. That would be a longer process. And I'm not sure how long it would take today to do a, a, a refit turnaround, a boiler cleaning and all that stuff on a, I don't know what, a Spruance class destroyer, if we even have any more of those. I've been out of the Navy for a long time. Um, but it might take uh, two weeks, three weeks, and then they before they headed out again. Is that helpful? Yep. Great. Other questions from the audience? I have one for you, Professor. All right, fire away. Uh, with regard to McClellan and the peninsula, how important was the Navy's role in your opinion? Well, it could have been a lot more important. This was at a time in the war and actually this is most of the war, when the Army and the Navy, let me back this up a little bit. Remember that in 1861 to 1865, there's no Department of Defense, right? There's a Department of War, not a Department of the Army, but a Department of War, which was the Army and a Department of the Navy, each headed by a secretary, each sat in the cabinet, each had a full department and each was a rival of the other. It's particularly evident in Charleston, for example, when Gideon Wells refused to cooperate with the army in a joint command attack and the army wouldn't cooperate with the Navy. On those few times when they could cooperate, as at Vicksburg, for example, when Grant and David Dixon Porter worked together very well to take Vicksburg, it could work. But most of the time, they were rivals more than they were partners. And that's the case on the peninsula. This is early in the war. It's 1862. What uh, McClellan thought the Navy should do was blast its way up the York River to cover his right flank and up the James River to cover his left flank as he advanced up the peninsula. The Navy said, oh, we really can't do that. First of all, the Confederacy has fortifications built at the Narrows on the York River and we can't get past it. If you've ever driven over that, uh, that bridge on your way to Norfolk, you see that you can still see the fortifications in place there. So it would have been a dangerous passage, but no more dangerous than running past Mobile Bay, for example. And the reason they said they couldn't go up the James River was because the Confederates had an ironclad there, the ship vessel that we tend to call the Merrimack and that they called the Virginia. So the Navy really didn't cooperate in the way that McClellan thought they should. And McClellan being McClellan used that as an excuse for why he couldn't go anywhere at all. It's all the Navy's fault. So I hope that's respond. And another question, uh, Steve Pettyjohn. Professor, was the Dahlgren muzzle-loading smoothbore cannon the most effective naval weapon in the Civil War? Um, ah, what a great question. No, if you could have had more Whitworth rifles, for example, that was far more effective, but they were so scarce, they had to be imported from Britain. If you don't know about the Whitworth, it had a octagonal barrel that had a twist on it and therefore required very special ammunition that had to be made very delicately. It had to fit precisely. So it was kind of a, uh, it was so precise that it was not really usable. You, anybody who's served any active duty time knows it's better to have a reliable weapon that fires regularly than a 
than a perfect little weapon that fires now and again. Uh, and that was the case with some of the advanced weapons. The nine inch smooth bore Dahlgren invented in the 1850s, there were thousands of them in service. So they're the ones that mattered. The ammunition was available, people knew how to use it. Its range was not that great. Its accuracy was not that great, but boy, it was reliable. You could fire it, you know, six, 800 times before you had to, you know, replace it out because they do wear out uh, these weapons. So I don't know if it was the best weapon of the war. It was the most important weapon of the Naval War. Okay. Sort of like the Sherman tank yeah. in World War II. Yeah, yeah, that's a good comparison. Did the Dahlgren turn Confederate ironclads into mincemeat? Hmm. Mark, could you repeat that for me? I didn't quite get it. Steve's question is, could the Dahlgren gun turn Confederate ironclads into mincemeat? And what I think he might be referring to in part is the battle between the Monitor and the Virginia. Not the monitor in the Virginia. The armor on the Virginia was too great for, uh, for the nine inch Dahlgren. In fact, the monitor had two 11 inch Dahlgrens in the turret. It had been designed for 15 inch guns. And later in the war, it would, in fact, the monitor class would carry 15 inch guns. Uh, but at, for example, off uh, Atlanta, on the South Carolina, not Atlanta, off the South Carolina coast, the Confederate ironclad Atlanta took on the Weehawken. And the Weehawken had 11 inch uh, uh, Dahlgrens and they punched right through the armor on the Atlanta because it was only two inches thick. Whereas the armor on the, uh, on the Virginia, the Merrimack, if you would, was, was uh, a foot of oak and then two layers of two inch iron armor bolted on top of it and and nothing that the 11 inches could not go through that uh, but if the ships were lightly armored two inches or less then what they would fire what's called a bolt which is really it's just a shape like a coffee can square ended solid iron steel really and fire that at close range with a heavy charge that could bust through some of those lighter armored ironclads, not only on the uh, Atlantic coast, but also on the inland rivers. Another question? Yeah. Um, why did, I, and I don't know if this is true or not, but why did Grant seem to have more cooperation with the Navy when he took Fort Donaldson and McClellan have so much problem with the Navy on the Peninsula campaign? Okay. To hear the question, Professor? Yeah, great, great question. It goes back to what I said before. They're two separate departments. If you have two commanders who agree to work with one another, then the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Two Navy, two Army equals five if they cooperate. If they don't cooperate, two Army and two Navy equal one because then they're working at odds with one another. So the, question, the answer really comes down to personalities. And at Vicksburg, for example, I give a lot of credit to Sherman and to Grant, who, believe it or not, sucked up to David Dixon Porter. Oh, Admiral, you're such a genius and so good looking. And we really, would you for us? So, of course, that cooperation worked out. The same was more or less true at Fort Donaldson, uh, where Grant, again, and Foote agreed to get along and work together. Uh, in Charleston, on the peninsula, in other places where there was attempted cooperation, and you had personalities that either didn't or wouldn't work together cooperatively, then it, it just didn't work. Okay. Yes, in the back. <clears throat> uh, forward to 1942, Battle of Midway. How many battleships did the Americans have engaged? The answer is zero. Um, not only had the battleship fleet suffered a pretty serious knock on the head on December 7th, 1941, but the problem with the battleships in 1942 was that even those that had been resuscitated from the bottom of the Pearl Harbor mud or had not been in Pearl Harbor on the day of infamy had a top speed of about 21 knots. The carriers could go 30 plus. So if you put the two of them together, 
uh, the battleships would slow the carriers down and become an anchor to any kind of progress they could make. Nimitz knew that, and he ordered all the battleships back to San Francisco. Get out of the way. You use too much fuel. You're too much trouble. You won't help us out anyway. Just leave. So the Americans had the three aircraft carriers plus cruisers and destroyers. The Japanese had four aircraft carriers plus two battleships. But of course, those battleships, other than providing extra AA support, played no role in the battle anyway. So the short answer to your question is the Americans had no battleships, and that's just the way Nimitz wanted it. Follow up. The reason I asked that question is because the Pennsylvania was in dry dock on December 7th and had minimal damage. And I've read reports that the Pennsylvania was actually uh, at the Battle of Midway. Uh, those reports are inaccurate. I have read every after action report on Midway, trust me. And the Pennsylvania was not in active service in the Battle of Midway. So I don't know where that comes from, but it, it's not accurate. United States Naval Captain. <laughs> well, what do they know? Come on, Mark and I know how fallible they can be. United States right. Naval Institute. Uh, I believe the the Pennsylvania would not have been the prime candidate for such a job. I think the Nevada would have been. Yeah, except mm. the Nevada was really shot to pieces. Well, she got underway. Yeah, yeah, and, and went aground. Hard. The only battleship that got underway and fired on the enemy. She was run aground on Nevada Point. That's true. Yeah. Because she was afraid that they were afraid yeah. she was going to sink. It was in dry dock, which basically unspread. Yeah. No, you're right. The fact that she was in dry dock saved her. I mean, they couldn't, obviously, the Japanese considered the torpedo their most effective anti ship weapon. And that, that is correct. It was. And they devised a system right before the attack, by the way, that would allow them to use them in shallow water. They had these detachable wooden fins that would drop off when it hit the water. So that so torpedoes were what did what destroyed ships. Now, the Arizona is an exception. The Arizona was hit by a 1500 pound uh, bomb, uh, actually a modified 18 inch battleship shell dropped from 10,000 feet that just penetrated her iron armor deck went straight to the magazine and exploded. But every other ship there was damaged by torpedoes. But because the Pennsylvania was in dry dock, they could not use torpedoes. So it suffered some topside damage, but was nevertheless operational very quickly afterward. Nimitz did not want it around. He told Pai, who was commanding the battleships, get those things out of here, take them back to San Francisco. We don't want them. We don't want to have to fill them full of fuel. They use lots and lots of oil. And he just, he got rid of them. Other questions? Yes, Steve again. Uh, following up on the battleships, I always wondered why the Japanese were sending battleships into Guadalcanal and we didn't use any of our older ones uh, to help in that operation. We didn't have any until we sent them to Washington and the South Dakota. Was it the auto thing again? They just go peel off? Yeah. Well, remember that the Washington and the South Dakota are the new fast battleships. Those are the new ones. Those aren't Pearl Harbor survivors. Those aren't dreadnoughts from pre-war. Those are the new ones. And they did get into the naval battle of Guadalcanal and sank both the Hai and the Kirishima, which was significant. That's probably the turning point in the whole campaign. So that is critical. The Japanese used battleships early on in the campaign for Guadalcanal because they could not compete with the Cactus Air Force from Henderson Field. So they used battleships to shell the airport in the hopes of grounding the, Amer the Cactus Air Force so that they could get more reinforcements into the island. Uh, so that was the reason they employed battleships early. Uh, and again, Ernie King, who was CNO in comments, he wanted Nimitz to commit battleships early on. And Nimitz said, nope, they're too much trouble. We just don't want them. The new ones are different. Once the North Carolina and the Washington and the South Dakota got out there, that's a game changer. Now they can go 28 knots and they can mostly keep up with the carriers. And of course, uh, Willis Lee with the Washington sank the, the high E with uh, two salvos. So yeah, I mean, there's really a, almost a generational difference 
between the pre-war dreadnoughts, the kinds of ships that were damaged in the Pearl Harbor attack on December 7th, and the new fast battleships that came online in late 1942. That it's just a, a gen technological generational difference. Another follow-up. Yeah, uh, the Hei and the Hiroshima were battle cruisers from World War One that had been slightly modified. That's the reason they were in the South Pacific because of their speed, as opposed to their uh, armor, their speed, and they could their throw weight. So that when they came up against these these new American battleships, they were basically outclassed. Follow up yeah, question. Go ahead. I think that's mostly true. The Japanese actually classed them as battleships. They counted them as battleships in their uh, category of, of ship designations. But I'll take your word for it that they were uh, effectively heavy battle cruisers. I, I won't dispute that. Professor, I have a, another question for you. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. when I took Naval History at the Naval Academy, it wasn't under your tutelage, but it was under uh, an Army captain, actually. And it occurred to me that Admiral Farragut was unbelievably lucky to survive Mobile Bay because the torpedoes, the mines, didn't work. And had they worked, uh, Admiral Farragut may not have been as celebrated as he is today. He'd be regarded as a fool for going into an active minefield when the Tecumseh went down. And yet, you can also say Admiral Nimitz took the risk at Midway based on intelligence he got from uh, Commander Rochefort and uh, turned the tide because he caught the Japanese at the wrong moment refueling their aircraft when in the middle of between strikes on Midway. So the question is, from your vast experience at the uh, Naval War College and at the Naval Academy, is it better to be lucky or good? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know that's a great question i don't know how many people in the audience have read my book on midway but that's the theme of the book is this a product of luck did we just chance into this i mean you know there are lots of elements that look like luck. we arrive at just the right moment uh, dick best puts a bomb on the akagi it's the only bomb that hits her and it hits in exactly the right place at exactly the right time what are the odds of that okay so luck is involved and I'm going to confess that luck is involved in every military undertaking anywhere, anytime, forever. Uh, so I'm not going to discount luck entirely, but I do think you can make your own luck. Nimitz had a phrase that he used in a lot of his orders. He used it with Halsey. He used it with Spruance. He used it with almost everyone who served under his command. And the phrase was calculated risk. Every engagement involves risk. The commander's responsibility is to calculate how much risk is acceptable given the potential outcome, either positive or negative. And it, it's, it's not something you can do with a computer in your hand. It's not something you can actually calculate. It, it, a better term, in fact, would have been intuitive understanding of the circumstances. It requires a commander with the kind of careful assessment of luck as well as risk in deciding what orders he's going to give. And I think that in the case of Midway uh, and as Farragut too, uh, each calculated, sometimes quickly, what risk was acceptable given the circumstances. Now, what we need to know about torpedoes in the American Civil War is that they worked about one out of 20 times. You know, you, you get a wooden barrel and you fill it with black powder and you put tar and pitch all over it and, and wire it to the, with an anchor and you drop it to the ground. And what you hope is that, you know, there's a little glass vial at the top and that a ship will bump it. The glass vial will break. Fulminate of mercury will ignite the black powder. The barrel will blow up and the ship will be crippled or sunk. <laughs> But that's a pretty delicate system. And seawater is a pretty volatile substance in terms of eroding all sorts of equipment, even today. So Farragut knew all of this and knew that, you know, you can't just say, well, gosh, there are torpedoes that they're all going to blow up. If one out of 20 is going to blow up and I'm going through there, I, I've got a pretty good risk. And not doing it meant that the Brooklyn would back into him and he'd back into the ship behind him and they'd all go clunk, clunk, clunk and they were directly under the guns of Fort Morgan 
So making that risk calculation, he decided going through the minefield was the least risky option that he confronted. And he took it. And he was right. And I would say the same kind of thing about Nimitz. I, I, I know there's luck involved at Midway. There's luck involved both for and against the Japanese and for and against the Americans. But it's what you do with the opportunities that you have that determines whether you'll be successful or not. So I leave it to, it's too glib to me to simply say, oh, Farragut and Nimitz were lucky. No, I don't think so. They recognized circumstances. They did the calculation. They made a decision. And it turned out well. It didn't always, but it's not just luck. So I'll go back to my first answer. It's better to be both. <laughs> Others. Yep, one more. Uh, Post-war post years for Farragut and Porter, what did they do after, after the war? Well, Farragut, of course, is significantly older. So he retired once the war was over. He's 65 years old. There were nobody on active duty 65 years old in those days. But he got promoted to the rank of admiral. He's America's first admiral uh, and retired in that grade, the first ever to do so. Uh, Porter stayed on. Porter went back to the Naval Academy, served two consecutive tours as superintendent. And the road on which all the big shots now live is called what, Mark? Porter Road. Porter Road. He's the guy. Yeah. He's also the guy who instituted June Week and physical fitness as a reason for being in the afternoons. He offered to get to box any midshipman who was stupid enough to challenge him, but he would. And he was a remarkable. I did fellow. Know that. that is a great story. Thank you. Yep. He offered to do that to enhance physical education there. So, but would you agree that he was the consummate naval uh, self promoter of the Civil War? He was that. And I didn't want to get too much into that. He's really, uh, you know, that letter that he wrote about his brother, he's trying to get the job himself. So he, he trash talks his brother. He was also a guy who uh, captured as much cotton as he possibly could on the Red River expedition to make himself rich. He's also, he wrote a book after the war, which might as well have been named How I Won the War by Myself. I mean, he was <laughs> one of those guys that uh, was not shy, shall we say. But certainly Grant was able to cooperate with a number of people, including Porter and Foote, far beyond McClellan. Yeah, and I give I give most of the credit for that to Grant rather than to his counterparts. Okay, last okay. question. What one last. That? One last one. Okay. What did Nimitz do during World War One? During World War One, Nimitz started out in submarines, and he wanted command. He had early command of a submarine before World War One, but in 19. 17, when the United States went to war, he was named the chief of staff of Admiral Robeson, who was the service uh, fleet commander. And it was Nimitz, quite frankly, I don't want to say invented, nobody invents things, but he put together the protocols for underway replenishment. Not first bow to stern and then subsequently side to side and underway replenishment. He supervised the first uh, execution of that uh, in 1918. So what kept the United States fleet underway during much of World War II was based on the protocols that he had established during World War I. Okay. Well, that's all the questions for tonight. Professor, thank you so much for giving your presentation. My pleasure. Thanks that. for inviting me. And I'm all glad right. you were able to do this by Zoom. Me too. Next, Glad it worked next out. Time, next time, we hope it's in person. That would be great. I look forward to it. Very good. All right. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.